All right, welcome back everybody to Thursday night live with our Ephraim Goldberg question, questions and answers. We try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, I appreciate you joining and you know how we like to do. We're gonna jump straight into this on here, not waste any time. It's not that type of show. We're gonna, we're gonna jump right in. Our Ephraim Goldberg. Shalom Aleichem. How are you doing, Nachi? Good, Baruch Hashem. It's, it's, it's uh, good to see you again. Always good to see you. Uh, there's actually, I'm in my office, but there's a Thursday night at Shul. We have a Cholent and Kumza thing going on, and they're right loud and loud. I don't know if you can hear them. If you can, it's a plus. <laughs> I don't hear them. I'm, uh, unfortunately, I don't hear them. All right, we'll see if they get louder. How are you? Baruch Hashem. All good. I, I don't remember. Did did we have off last week and we were on two weeks ago? So exactly. It's been a couple of weeks. All right. Okay. So there's a lot of questions saved up from uh um to from the island. So, All right, well forward. Let's dive in. Let's bring it on. Let's dive right in. Okay. Um for everyone who's watching, as you know, uh you can go ahead and send in questions in the question thingy below right over there or you can comment it, and we'll try to ask it. The question I'd like to start off with this evening, it's a little bit broad, but I think it's something we can discuss, is our yeshiva system failing our youth? Wow. Didn't you want me to answer on, like, short soundbite nuggets? Is our yeshiva <laughs> failing our youth? I would say that overwhelmingly our yeshiva system is succeeding our youth. Baruch okay. We have selfless... Uh, Rebbe and Mora's teachers, administrators, Menalem, they're dedicated, they're devoted, they're selfless. Every one of them could be making much more money in another field, another line of work. They've given up themselves and they've entered a life a choice that is benefiting. And we have such a beautiful, rich tapestry of Jewish continuity, children who are not only um, educated, but inspired and overwhelmingly it's successful. That said, of course, there are many tweaks that we need to be offering to the system. Um, there, first of all, when we talk about the system, which system? There are so many systems within the Torah world, the Hasidic educational system, the Litvish system, there's the Yeshivish system, the modern system. There are so many different systems, so it's kind of hard to pinpoint specifically. But I would say, if I had to mention one thing, it's this. And obviously tuition and what used to be called the tuition crisis, before there was a virus crisis, there was a tuition crisis. Um, let's not touch on. But if there was one thing that I could revamp the system and introduce into the system, it would be this, talking about the Rebona Shalom, talking about Hashem. I think absolutely every, every topic in Limude Kodesh, if you're learning Chumash, the Rashi, the Ramban, the Ibn Ezra, the Svarno, how are each of them understanding this story or this Pasuk or this Halacha differently so that they can connect with Hashem? more. What is their message? What is their lesson? In what way does this leave me feeling more connected to him? When we learn Gemara, we're not just learning abstract, esoteric halachas, my ox gores your ox. It's what is God's vision for this world? How do we understand what it means to take ownership? How does it understand what it means to take responsibility, to protect? How do we understand what Hashem's vision for us is when it comes to uh, all laws, criminal, tort, civil laws. So every area of Torah we learn, from Chumash, Navi, Halacha, to the bottom line in every classroom should be, we don't close the book of the Sefer, we don't close the lesson of the class until we extract from it. How does this change my relationship with Hashem? Is God part of the conversation? Is He the author of the story or the Halacha of the law? Does it enrich my understanding of who I am and my role and my mission in this world. And I think that tragically, all too often, Torah learning becomes an intellectual exercise where there's so much pressure to cover ground or learn facts or information or qualify to get into that seminary, that yeshiva at the next stage. And therefore, we are not really rooting it in its source in what's the most important thing that there is to talk about, which is that all of this Torah is supposed to bond us and bind us to Hashem, leaving us feeling closer to Him. So if I could revamp anything, if I can introduce something. And I think the challenge is that so many of our machanchim, our extraordinary, outstanding self machanchim, they weren't educated this way, so they lack the vocabulary to educate the next generation. So we need to disrupt the system. We need to disrupt the cycle. We need to bring some of that conversation, some of that, soon we're going to read Parshish Vayetze, there's a chassid shavort that says, 
um, that when Yaakov rests his head, it says, uh, Yaakov wakes up, Vayikatz Mishnaso, and he says, Achin Yesh Hashem Bamakom Azev, Anochi Lo Yadati. He wakes up from his sleep, and he says, God is here, I had no idea. I didn't realize God is outside the Beit Hamikdash. I didn't know God's outside the shul. I didn't realize God is in the mundane. God is in my pillow and my, my nap. But I forgot the, the which Chassid the Shereba said, says in the Svarim Makedashim, that what happened, Vayikatz Mishnaso, that word Shnaso, the Shanos also means to learn. Yaakov woke up from his learning, and he said, Yesh Hashem Bamakom Azeh, Vanochi Lo Yadati. I didn't realize God's in Baba Kama, Baba Metziah. I didn't realize God's in Reb Chaim. I didn't realize God is in Parshas Vayera. I didn't realize God. I didn't realize that my Torah learning is supposed to leave me feeling closer to God. Anochi lo yadati. So that's if I could make a change, that's what I would put the focus on. So, sounds very fair. Uh, moving on to the next question. I'm going to keep you on your toes. Not going to sit with any topic too long. Wow. Um, this is an interesting one. Okay. Um, out there in, in the Jewish world exists extremism. Uh, there exist people who, who are doing things that are wrong. Take Natura Karta, for example. I think, I hope a lot of us can agree what they're doing is, is absolutely terrible. I once was speaking to somebody, um, I was speaking badly about Natura Karta, and the person said to me, you know, it's the craziest thing is that Hashem loves them just as much as he loves you. And that really, like, this happened to me many years ago, and it still just sits with me, like Hashem loves them just as much as he loves me. So we obviously know that when someone does something wrong down here, we don't know what that does, ultimately. It does, does, does you know, let's say there are people who created this awful Chil Hashem Netflix show, whatever it is. There are people that we look at down here on, on this earth, and we're like, these are the worst people, and there's a special place for these people. But is there? Is there? Does Hashem love them just as he much just just as much as he loves us? What's 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 the answer to that? that is, that's a great question. It's a deep question. I didn't give my usual disclaimer that I give every week, which is I don't have all the answers and I'm not an authority, but I can only share my my thoughts and what works for me on these types of questions. Um, how much Hashem loves each of us, I'll leave to Hashem to decide. I think the moment that we start to project or we start to reflect or we start to guess. Um, from Hashem's perspective, we're trying to play God. And there's only one infinite, one omnipotent God. Rebona Shalom is, he's Hayahova Vi'ya, he's, he's everything. So to think that we can get inside his head, and we say as a parent, do I love all my children equally? Of course I love my children equally. If one was an axe murderer, would I love him as much as the one that, you know, uh, knows Kola Tarakula or found the cure to cancer? We're, we're trying to think in a very human sense and then project that onto Hashem. Let Hashem do his job. He asked us in this world to do our job and to clearly have those boundaries. Stay in our land. Don't try to be him. So does, he, does Hashem love us all equally? That's for Hashem to decide. Hashem is the one of the unlimited, uh, unlimited love. But what I would say is the following. In life, our job is to always ask ourselves, what am I meant to do? So there's a Neture Karta. A Neture Karta, the Rambam writes that while everyone's human and everyone's fallible and everyone has faults, and generally our attitude is to say that people are good people who do bad things rather than say that they're bad people. But there is such a thing as bad people. There are people who are bad people. The Ramam describes that there are people who do such bad, wicked things that they've actually purged whatever Tzalem and Lokim they had inside themselves. They have actually, they've pushed out and they've purged whatever godly soul, whatever godliness was in them. Do Neture Karta meet that definition? I don't know. I'm not sure I'm smart enough to know. I know what they're doing is dangerous and damaging. I know that they threaten the safety and well-being of Kalah Israel by supporting and aligning themselves with people who are our enemies and want to see our destruction. That's pretty bad to me. Are they bad people? Is it just bad things? I'll leave that to Hashem to decide. All we know is our mission and our mandate is to be good people, to do the best that we can. But is, the mission, is the mission to be good to them, though? I, I don't think so. I don't know that we have to be good to them. Um, I think that we have to offset them. I think that when the Ture Karta are setting back our mission the Chil Hashem of what look like religious Jews in the news who are on the horrifically wrong side of issues just makes our work even harder and we have to double down and we have to do even better to be able to make a Kiddush Hashem and to be able to outshine. You know, they're making the world a little darker so we have to bring even more light. So we can fixate on them and we can try to determine from Hashem where their special place in, in Gehenim is or we can feel the responsibility ourselves to be filled with light, to offset with light to fill the world with light and to do light. What I will say is, is that 
And also there's another connection to our parsha that we're reading. If you'll notice, both with Migdal Bava, when it came to the tower they were building to compete with God in the heavens, and again in, uh, in last week's parsha, or in this week's parsha rather, with Stom, God keeps saying, let me come down to take a look. I'll come down and take a look at the tower in this week's parsha with stone. Let me come down and take a look at stone. Why does God need to come down? That's perfect. God is omnipotent, omniscient. He knows everything. He knows it from where he is. What does he have to come down and take a closer look? So Rashi quotes the measure that tells us it's a very important lesson for us. Don't ever come to a conclusion without seeing for yourself. How often do we hear secondhand or thirdhand and then we take that as, well, we take it as fact. Go see for yourself. Examine. Hear both sides. Don't come to a conclusion without seeing for yourself. Hashem didn't, and we shouldn't either. But I'll leave you with this, Nachi. Not altogether. I'll leave this question with this. Rav Schwab, that's how Rav Schwab writes in the Sefer. You know why it says God comes down? Because from the place of perfection, from the place of the internet, of the internet, from the place of the infinite, we have no tolerance for people who are imperfect. From the place of the infinite, how can we tolerate people who make mistakes? So Hashem comes down and he says, you know what? In this world that's filled with temptation, desire, in this world that's filled with complication, Hashem comes down. Because when we're able to lower ourselves and realize that people are human and they have failures, people are human, they have temptation, desires, now we can tolerate the misgivings, the shortcomings, the failures of others much more. So basically, God is telling us, get off your high horse, come out of your ivory tower, live in another person's shoes, understand what they're coming from, and now maybe you'll tolerate or understand a little bit better. It doesn't mean you should accept, doesn't mean you should accept necessarily, but it means you'll be able to tolerate a little better. Okay. Uh, next question, Ray Goldberg. Um, this is obviously something that you were very involved in, and <laughs> there are some people who are commenting stuff, which is just beautiful. It's great. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll humor them a little bit and discuss the topic uh, that you were very involved with, which was the Aguna crisis. Um, one that you really, you know, went in head first. You, you weren't shy about, uh, you weren't quiet about it. You made very clear w what your stance was. Um, and I guess really the question is, is where do we go from here? Uh, the fact that this happened in 2021, when there, there, there are, there were, there are many who, women who are changed, chained to marriages, um, abusive situations that they're not receiving a get. A lot of people are calling for reform, but Orthodox Judaism is not reformed, so I, I don't know exactly how that works. Um, Two-part question, and you could really decide how, how, which part you want to answer mm -hmm. first is, A, you kind of, you know, put yourself out there, and um, again, even for people watching this live, they're able to flip through the comments, they can see there are people who don't like you for it, there are people who are upset with you. Um, how do you, how do you uh, I guess, make that calculation and say, you know what, I'm, I'm doing what's right, so I don't care. Um, and on, on the flip side, what's going to be? What's the future of, of Agunas? There, there are people who are still Agunas. So, so what happens? It's a great question. It's a very painful question. And, and it's one that a lot of people have thoughts and answers to, but they haven't necessarily sat opposite Naguna. And they haven't necessarily sat with a woman who has gone through the process, has done everything asked of her, has cooperated, is not practicing parental alienation, is not vilifying the husband, is not doing whatever she's doing as, as leverage or extortion. And yet, despite that, for no reason at all, other than to punish her, her husband will give her a get. And maybe he's moved on, maybe he's running around, maybe he's doing what he wants, and she is trying to be a Bas Torah, she is trying to do what's proper, and she can't move on. And her childbearing years are passing, and her youth is passing, and she's wondering, will I ever be able to remarry again? That pain is extraordinary, and it's not only her own pain, it's her parents, it's her siblings, it's her friends, who watch that, that loneliness and that excruciating pain that seems there's no way out. Now, some people look at that pain and they say, this is a flawed system. God made a mistake. And you know what? I can't tell you how often I've heard this. If we came up with the Purse Bowl to avoid Shemitah canceling loans, and we came up with the Shabbos elevator to be able to make it to the top floor without sweating, and we came up with selling chametz so we could keep our scotch collection, then why can't we come up with a solution to the Aguna? And, and it's a very good question. It's a very compelling question. But the answer is that we have to work within the system we have. It's a divine system. It's a system we're bound by that Hashem gave us. And we have to operate within its rules. We have to operate within its laws. And we can't distort or manipulate or change. And each of those other examples are operating within the halacha. They're all operating within the halacha. 
Here in Aguna, and the Ag- oh, don't worry, I'll get to these comments. Nachi, I see. That. <laughs> I got. They're not. They're not distracting me. So, do you, do you want me to do anything, or just let it be? No, let them be. People should express okay. themselves. Right, okay. Love all Jews, and Hashem loves. If Hashem loves them, I can love them. Even those who don't love me back so much. <laughs> so, um, when it comes to the Aguna, we can blame Hashem and His Torah, but God didn't create this problem. God created a set of rules, and it's the people who are abusing the rules that create the problem. In the same way that it's people, it's human beings who are creating the problem by abusing and misusing his laws, then it's we people who can rise to the occasion and we can be the solution. We can be the solution. So no Aguna should ever feel alone, first of all. It should have the support and the love. Let me give this very, very important um, clarification. Not every woman who declares herself an Aguna is an Aguna. It has to be a proper halachic system, a bezden, a posek, rav, a das Torah, that can attest to the fact that she's gone through a system, she's reached that status that she's an aguna. The woman says to her husband, leave the house, I want to get by tomorrow, and says, he didn't give it to me within 24 hours, I'm an aguna, doesn't make her an aguna. Not every woman is innocent and every man is the villain. There are cases, I've seen them, I've been involved in them, where the man is the innocent party, And the woman is the villain in how manipulative she's being, parental alienation. And it's very, very difficult for a lot of men in divorce in the the community where um, they feel the community always sides with a woman. And it's not always the woman who's right. Sometimes it's the man who's right as well. But that said, where there's a bona fide case of an aguna, we can rise to her her, uh, support. We should be protesting. There are what's called the hachakas de Rabbeinu Tam, the halachic system for millennia for a millennia, has recognized the challenge of Aguna, and it has empowered us with socially ostracizing somebody who's not doing the right thing until they feel the social pressure give the get. But our silence and our indifference, it contributes to that person's loneliness and to their being the victim of the abuse of withholding a get. So if we would all make our voices loud and clear, and you know, there were a group of influencers and there was a groundswell of support, and I'm gonna say something controversial, I wish they'd come back, I wish they hadn't disappeared. It was like a 15 minute influencer phenomenon, organizing rallies, making their voices heard, featuring victims, it made a huge difference. Why did it stop? Because the next, the news cycle changed and the next thing happened. And it was Corona and it was Yontif and it was this and it was that. And I'm not criticizing anyone. They were wonderful and courageous to have brought it up to begin with. And we should all encourage them to renew their courage, to bring it up again, because I think that, uh, I think that we, when we put that social pressure, we see the impact that's made. The real answer to the Aguna crisis, the real answer to the Aguna crisis is uh, the halachic prenup. Now, for a time, the Basin of America had a halachic prenup. It was written with Rabbi Vadi Yosef, Rav Zalman Nechemya, Goldberg, Rav Asher Weiss, major, major post from Eretz Israel and America. If every single couple that got married signed the halachic prenup, there would not be an Aguna. For a long time, it was decided that was the YU world. However... Today, Diane First in Chicago, the Aguda is considering a form of a, of a halachic prenup. Mishpacha Magazine did a whole story on the halachic prenup. And you will see that the more cases of Aguna throughout the whole Torah community, the more the broader, wider Torah community will embrace and encourage the prenup. And if we all use the halachic prenup, whichever version and whatever form, then that we can eliminate the cases of Aguna. Most important thing, the first thing I should say is to feel sympathy and empathy to feel the pain, to make that other person feel that they're not alone, that they're not the one who's wrong, and to rise up and to help them, to defend them, to care about them, and to try to get them. Again, in this week's parasha, Hashem says, I'm going to tell Avram what I'm going to do to Stom. Ha-mechasa, Avram, can I perhaps, is it possible for me to hold it back? Impossible. And why does he feel obligated to tell Avram? I know that Avram is going to tell his children to what? Lasos mishpa utstaka. Why does he love Avram? Because he shuckles the longest? He memorized the most mishnayas? Those are all very, very important things. But the legacy we have from Avram is justice and charity. Stand up for the underdog. Stand up for the victim. Make our voices heard. Don't let them feel alone. And if we all did that, we can make a, a change and a shift in this. Okay. Um, and I guess the other part of the question, which Come. is the, what? Yeah, your involvement, the backlash it's, it's receiving. I'm sure that maybe before you, you did this, there were, let's say, people who are upset about other things, but after this, you know, it seems like uh, wherever you go, there's some people trying to sabotage. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you the truth. I am such an imperfect person. And, and if you had my wife and kids on and others, they would tell you how imperfect I am. There are so many things to be publicly critical about me about, and it would keep me up at night. 
it would break my heart and it would make me feel horrifically guilty. And nobody beats me up more than I beat myself up about many of these things. And offline, I'm happy to share some of them with you. But anyone who's criticizing me for caring about Agunas, I don't think a moment, I don't think an iota, I don't think, I don't hesitate at all. Because my attitude and my approach towards it is, is from my Rebbeim, is from Das Torah, is from Gedola Yisrael. I don't make a move in supporting an Aguna, organizing a rally, coming to her defense without understanding the whole issue and having the support of the Beisdin or of, of a Gadol Yisrael. And so it doesn't bother me. Any criticism that comes that way doesn't bother me in the least. I don't have the thickest skin. And it is being a rabbi. You see, I used to have hair up here. It not, used to all not be gray down here. I don't have the thickest skin. And sometimes it hurts. Criticism hurts. Some of these comments, be, not because of the people writing them or what they're writing, but people who don't know, it can hurt. But on the Aguna issue, it doesn't hurt at all because I'm so confident I know what's right. Remember, Nachi, listen, you're a public figure. You don't get emails. You don't get people who are critical. How could you feature that minute? How could you feature that person? How could you not feature me? How could you feature that ad? How could you feature that story? You must get criticism. So here's my chizik for you. Mordechai, at the end of the story of the Megillah, he saves Shushan. He saves the Jews. And they have a vote for him. And he's going to be reelected as the rabbi, Mordechai. And he's Ratzoi Lerov Echav. He only wins by a majority. Who voted? Who voted against him? Are you kidding me? Mordechai Yehudi doesn't get a unanimous vote when he saves the entire Shushan? The answer is there's always going to be detractors. There's always going to be haters. There's always going to be. It just means you're doing something right. The last, uh, the, la the last question or last point on this topic before we move on is if someone were to be watching right now who was um, a guy that was withholding a get from his wife, um, could you speak directly to him right now? You know, what would you say? Yeah, sure. Aram, I love you. You're a holy Jew. You have a beautiful heart and you have a big neshama. I know it. I've seen it firsthand. And you deserve happiness and you deserve a bright future and you deserve only positive public publicity. So give the get, give the get. What you want, you've gotten, whatever, I'm not gonna share details right now, but whether it's the opportunity to have a day in Bayesden in court, whether it's the opportunity financially to be able to, uh, to possibly get what you're looking for, it's available. Do the right thing, give the get, unchain, let your wife move on the way you've moved on, and then you'll be fully embraced and celebrated because the real you, this is not me, the Rambam described, it's the person inside themselves, the Pintaliyid wants to do the right thing. And sometimes we get emotionally involved, emotionally invested. And we have to go down and see from that person's perspective. Maybe they feel abandoned or violated. Maybe they feel lonely or hurt. Maybe they have their own background that leaves them feeling they need to do that. You don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. You, you can go through the rest of your life or the next period of time as a villain or as a hero. Step up, do the right thing. And, and turn around the story entirely, become an advocate for this, that people deserve to find the happiness, the happiness they're entitled to. Awesome. Uh, for everyone watching, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, uh, we're entering the final stages of this week's episode. So go ahead and just comment or you can request to join the live. And if we have um, a lot of faith in humanity, maybe we'll actually bring you on here to ask a question. Nachi, how do you, how do you deal with the hate? What do you do with, uh, you have no hate. What would, what would you do theoretically if you had <laughs> criticism of meaningful people, meaningful minute? Um, it does exist. Um, and I guess it, it used to be a lot more difficult to deal with. Um, I don't know. I have a good support system, you know, good people around me, uh, people who care about me, people who, uh, who I actually I, I listen to. I, um, I, uh, I think it's important for someone who's receiving criticism or hate is to really call it what it is, you know, um, and to not for a second think like, oh, that's, that's good. That's criticism I should take. Sometimes there's stuff that's being said that's so crazy and you just have to, you know, like a quarterback, you know, gets to the, gets to the line and he, and he sees, okay, that guy's blitzing, that guy's there, you know, so you got to call it out for what it is. That's hate, you know, that's, that's hate. That's someone who's trying to be destructive and you gotta like, you know, as the uh, well-known singer once said, you have to shake it off. There you go. That's it. <laughs> I'll, tell you one, I'll tell you one other thing that I think about with this is to try to separate out the messaging from the message and the messenger. And what do I mean by that? So as a public personality who puts a lot out there, you get a lot of emails, a lot of texts, a lot of feedback. And some of it is not communicated in the most um, productive way or kind way or respectful way. I don't mean respectful 
to a rabbi, I mean respectful to any human being. And every time I get that, I try to look at, I try to separate out the message from the messenger and the messaging. Sometimes you don't like the messenger. It's somebody who you know is hypercritical, is negative, they're a hater, and, and therefore you don't really want to listen to the message because you don't like the messenger. Sometimes you don't like the messaging. They're using very harsh language, abusive language, obnoxious language. They're not being sensitive, respectful. But I always try to say, but what about the message? Is there truth to the message? Maybe there's something in the message I need to listen to anyway. Because if the message is meant for me and I'm meant to hear it and it's from Hashem, I need to grow from it. We recently had on our, uh, behind the bimmer, Of course. Shameless plug. We recently had on the behemoth of Moshe Weinberger for the second time. And he told a story when he was a kid that there was a classroom when he was a kid that had a divider down in the classroom. It wasn't a full machitza. It was like a divider. And it was at lunch and he heard two kids talking. He heard his name and he recognized their voices. It was, it was two of his best friends and they were talking about him. He came home that day, he was shattered. And he said to his father, his father saw he was all sabrach and he was all miserable. What's the matter? What's wrong? He said, you won't believe it. At lunch, I overheard. They didn't realize I was standing there and could hear. They were talking about me. So his father said to him, let me ask you what they were saying. Was it true? Did it have merit? And he said, you know, I guess when I, th- when I hear, yeah, it did. So his father said, it doesn't matter who said it or how they said it. You were meant to hear the message because it had truth for you. So I think that sometimes we can take that criticism. And so, and it's important to be surrounded by people we can trust and love, spouses, rebellion, friends, and say, look, I got this email, I got this criticism. You think there's some, a lesson in it for me? Forget who said it or how they said it. Something to learn? If the person says, no, you did nothing wrong, keep going, you're good then you know you're good. Sometimes the person might say, spouse might say, look, the person and the way they said it, delete. But what they said, there's something to think about. Maybe there's a way to grow from it. Absolutely, no, I definitely, I definitely appreciate that. Uh, the, the last question I wanna to get to before we, um, we finish up for this evening is um, rabbis in politics. Uh, should rabbis be using their position, the pulpit, uh, their positions in communities, to um, be speaking about politics, to take us take a side on on candidates or on policies, and should they, you know, use that, I guess, authority uh, to impose what they what they feel is correct. It's a great question, longer than for two minutes. Maybe we'll start with it for now at least. Um, how do you define what's politics? One person's politics is another person's. It's obvious, and we all need to speak out and stand up for it. So. For example, a few years ago when the Iran deal was entered into the Obama administration, so some people considered that politics. No rabbi should speak about it from the pulpit. And others considered it existential, Israel's well-being, life and death. How could I not speak about it? So right. it's complicated because how do you define what's politics and what's not politics? My general I mean, rule... You could take... I, mean, and I hate to cut you off, but let's, let's no, just like bring it very uh, contemporary. Let's say there's a video that goes around with with rabbis uh, speaking about vaccines or masking. Right. And there are many, many people that could feel like, you're my rabbi, you're my rav. This is maybe for the CDC to speak to. This is maybe for our local um, you know, health, health officials to speak about. But my rav shouldn't be speaking about this. Right. Yeah, it, it is complicated. So what's obvious to one person is political and people should stay away from controversial to another person. So who gets to define it? How is it defined? I'll tell you my general rule, personally. This is my, my rabbinate, my rabbonus, this is my rule. I think a rub speaking about politics in the pulpit is an abuse of the pulpit. We are empowered and we are charged with sharing Torah and Masorah, with trying to inspire and uplift, with trying to make the comfortable feel uncomfortable, the uncomfortable feel comfortable. That's our job. To stand up there and to pontificate about politics when there are legitimate debates and legitimate different points of view is I think to misuse the pulpit. That's not our job. I also think strategically it's foolish because every community and every congregation is gonna have diverse people with diverse political positions. So by definition, when you speak about politics, you're alienating a certain segment of the community. And why do that? I'm not talking about vaccines right now, I'm talking about who to vote for or Republicans versus Democrats or certain policy decisions, immigration and the like. When you get up there, you're, you're unlikely actually influencing people. Why are you entitled to believe that your political position is more authoritative than someone else's? This is not Torah. Um, and, and you're automatically going to make a certain segment of the community turn off, shut off, stop listening, or stop coming altogether 
because they don't align with where you're coming from. Is that really why they come to shul? You turn on any device, any smartphone, any computer, any TV, and all the headlines are politics. It's pundits and talking heads and politics all the time. Is that why people are coming to shul? They can read that, they can get that, they can think that everywhere else. When you come to shul, be uplifted, be inspired, be transformed, be challenged, to leave your comfort zone, be a better person, break out and break free. So there's an enormous downside to doing politics in the pulpit. I think there's very little upside. Now the argument will be, well, Rabbanim and Torah has a position on these political issues and it's our job to educate the people what they are. So write an article if you want to do that. Hold a separate class where the people who come will be self-selecting. But on a Shabbos morning to use that pulpit, what for some people is the only time of the whole week that they set aside to learn and to talk politics, it's toxic, it's poisonous, it's divisive. It's not our job, it's not our role, it's not productive, it's not helpful. That's why personally I stay away from it. So in short, the answer is no. It shouldn't be done. I think the answer is no. There's a room, there's room in politics, meaning Rabbanu should be active in politics. I think we, we advocate, we, we try to pursue our interests. There's a lot of room for Rabbanu to use their position to try to advance the Jewish interests within politics. But I think to speak or to share politics from the pulpit, I think is wrong. Okay, we're going to go over one more thing. Really quickly, I'm going to let you go. We had a question asked by Shlomi Zions in the comments. He said, what safer should I be using, learning every single day for daily improvement? What's, what's the go-to? So you can go old school, right? classic Musr Sefer, like Mesil Sashar and Path of the Just. The Ramchal had it right. It's timeless. It's brilliant. The Gros said he walk across Europe barefoot to have had the chance to sit at the Ramchal's feet. It's got everything in it. Read it slowly. Think about it. Meditate. Be mindful on it. It's absolutely fantastic. It is, it is phenomenal. Um, there are other contemporary which are which are outstanding. If in Hebrew, Ravitcha Meyer's Svarim, Biyam Derechecha, are having a huge impact on me today. Rav Shlomo Hoffman's Svarim have come in, out in English. If you can get Rav Shlomo Hoffman's insights into how to be the best version of yourself today, really go to great stuff. Okay, awesome. Rabbi Goldberg, really appreciate you coming on this evening. Look forward to the next time, and I hope you go ahead and enjoy the rest of that. Comes us over there in BRS. Thank you, Nachi. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for all the work that you do. And I'll tell the people, for you, for me, we all hear the negative. Nachi, thank you for the amazing work you're doing. You're inspiring Klai Israel. Keep it up. We all appreciate it. Have a great Shabbos. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone who joined. Have an amazing Shabbos.